Hello there. <laughs> some movies are so bad, they're good. And there are some movies that are so bad, they're just bad. Real bad. The worst ever made. And by last count, there were 50 of them. These truly are the 50 worst films ever made by human hands. From guys in gorilla suits to cross-dressers to armless kung fu masters. There are some you have probably seen, some you can't believe you've seen, and many you will never, ever want to see again. But they're all here from worst to god-awful. So sit back and lower your standards, because here are the 50 worst movies ever made. He dares to enter the street dressed in the clothes he so much desires to wear. Glenn is engaged to be married to Barbara. Glenn's problem is a deep one, but he must tell her soon. She's begun to notice things. Soon she will realize. Starting the list is a film that was not only written and directed by the notorious Ed Wood, but a film he also starred in as a transvestite, which also happened to be an activity he pursued in real life. A masterpiece that dared to delve closer to the heart of cross-dressing than any other in film history by using cinema tricks like gluing fake articles onto real newspapers. From 1953, Glenn or Glenda. When the Mesa of Lost Women was released, a new school of acting was introduced to the world. The School of Bad Acting. Oh, we've arrived. I trust your journey was pleasant. Well, moderately. I must confess, though, that I was a trifle uneasy when your driver headed into the Muerto Desert. But everything seems to have worked out. I want to fly. You... you want to... I've always wanted to fly. And now I will. And pay careful attention to the right of the screen, where Dr. Masterson, played exquisitely by Harmon Stevens, conceals his excitement. Jackie Coogan also shines as Dr. Aranya, the crazy scientist determined to create a master race of superwomen by injecting them with spider venom. But that also entailed having to create dwarves and giant spiders, too. From the deep, dark recesses of 1986 comes the movie Troll. The plot is simple. Tarak, the aforementioned troll, uses his magic emerald ring to turn the residents of an apartment complex into hideous plant pods, so it feels kinda like home. The only redeeming value Troll has is its cameo appearance by Sonny Bono and Julia Louis-Dreyfus's breakthrough film performance years before Seinfeld made her a TV star. And that ain't much. It's dead. It's dead. The 47th worst film of all time is Teenage Zombies. A technically awful horribly acted, steamy pile of cinema. This 1959 gem is also the first of many laughable horror films to use a man in a gorilla suit as either an evil henchman, or a zombie, or a maniac, or simply just a gorilla. Teenagers, yeah. Why didn't Phyllis Diller and Jane Mansfield make more films together, you ask? She knows too much, Herman. She must be destroyed! When I turn this knob, her fate will be sealed, and our secret will be safe forever! This is why, from 1965, The Fat Spy. Boy, this is some picture! Beware, it's Voodoo Woman! Deep 
In the jungles of somewhere, a mad scientist uses voodoo magic to make an indestructible slave thing. But the plot thickens like a meaty stew left out in the sun. I want that money so bad that every time I close my eyes, I can see it. There's a treasure involved with an array of characters like Chaka, the witch doctor, Bobo, the houseboy, and a hero named Touch Connors. It's 1957's Voodoo Woman. What have you done? I mean, what have I done? What, are you blaming this on me? Yes. The 44th worst film of all time is the box office bomb, Ishtar. Hello, Ishtar, you're more than a country. I put a price of 20,000 dirham on their heads this afternoon. Even though Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman starred in this financial flop, it would still prove to be the end of a career for its director, Elaine May. He's aiming at Will you stop me? Even now, nearly 20 years after its release, Ishtar has barely made back half of its $40 million budget. It seems Warren and Dustin felt there was a longing for another road picture, like the ones Bob Hope and Bing Crosby used to make 30 years prior. We're wrong on the road to Morocco. This taxi is tough on the spine. It appears Warren and Dustin were wrong. Real wrong. A gigantic man-like creature appears. When Frankenstein's heart is stolen from Germany, shipped to a lab in Japan, and then exposed to radiation from the Hiroshima bombing of World War II, then eaten by a strangely mutated boy who grows at a rapid pace, you're left with 1965's Frankenstein Conquers the World. A Japanese film with an entire Japanese cast and one white guy, Nick Adams. Well, I feel he's very important from a scientific point of view. I'd have to cut off a leg or an arm. Doctors, I won't let you conduct this test. The original climactic ending had Frankenstein fighting Godzilla. But the director thought that was too hard to believe. So Frankenstein just ends up fighting a vague reptilian giant monster to the death. When Arthur Nelson made his producing, directing, editing, and acting debut in The Creeping Terror, he convinced several investors that he was making a big-budget horror film. And for just a few hundred dollars, these investors could not only have small parts in the film, but share in the profits after its release. My God, what is it? Just before the release of The Creeping Terror in 1964, Arthur Nelson vanished, with several lawsuits hanging over him. He hasn't been heard from since. And if you're wondering why there's no dialogue between actors throughout most of the film, it's because the director, producer, editor, actor Arthur Nelson accidentally knocked the sound recording equipment into Lake Tahoe and couldn't afford to buy a new microphone. He narrated the entire movie in post-production. At this very moment, KID-TV has standing by a television crew at Santa Claus Workshop. When the children of Mars become depressed and dismal, there's only one thing to do. We need a Santa Claus on Mars. Earth has had Santa Claus long enough. We will bring him to Mars. I'm against it. From 1964, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. Full of breathtaking special effects. <laughs> Turn off that decoration! <laughs> Plus, horrible acting. Coupled with a freeze ray gun that's really just a whammo toy painted silver. You can't take him now. It's too near Christmas. Quiet, you. But. 
and strange, surreal scenes like this. Hello there. <laughs> and if all that's not enough, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians also has a young Pia Zadora in her film debut as Germar, the girl Martian. The doll has a teddy bear pet and the teddy bear has a doll pet. He has everything except fulfillment. And then one night, it happens. Hey, good buddy, are you home? Number 40 on the list of the worst movies of all times belongs to 1986's Howard the Duck. Listen to me, small visitor. I can explain how you got here. Maybe you're here for some greater purpose, some cosmic cause. Even though this financial flop was produced by George Lucas, it made less than half of its $37 million budget back. A loss of nearly $21 million. Thanks, George. I'm sorry, we don't allow pets on the premises. At the end of World War II, Nazi officials removed the head of Adolf Hitler and sent it to a remote location until the Third Reich was ready to again attempt to rule the world. Now, depending on which section of They Saved Hitler's Brain you watch, that time could be 1961, when the last half of the film was shot, or 1968, when the first half of the film was made. I suppose you've seen this. Yeah, the papers are having a field day with this one. A solid seven-year gap between the end and the beginning. At one moment, we're enjoying the playful banter between secret agents. Look, I appreciate your enthusiasm. Well, I don't appreciate yours. You know, it's not very pleasant having to pull rank on you all the time. <laughs> You're telling me. And we were getting along so well. Let's keep it that way, huh? And seconds later, the film quality switches. New characters come into play. And we don't see our mustachioed secret agent and his portly partner again until the editor carefully splices the two films together. Hold it. In the car. Come on, move. Quick. Enter, Jim, Dragon, Kelly. He clobbers them off as Black Belt Jones. From 1974, the classic kung fu film starring Jim Kelly as Black Belt Jones and a cast of other characters with names like Toppy, Big Tuna, Blue Eyes, Pinky, Marv the Butcher, and jelly. Now what are you doing? No, no, you stay here till I get back. Do those dishes or something. They're done. With clever dialogue and kick-ass fighting sequences, Black Belt Jones is probably the only film on the 50 worst list to be so bad, it's good. Oh, Black Belt, she is good, man. She is bad. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Would you like to go away? Take a pair of socks and just stuff them in the, the silk panties, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just, uh, just so it bulges. And the first film in the United States to receive an X rating, as well as one of the lamest movies to come out of the 1960s, just about anything for a boy in a uniform. Even though Greetings was directed by a young Brian De Palma and starred an even younger Robert De Niro. You've heard of pop art. Oh, yes. Well, sure. this is called peep art. This 1968 turkey still makes the 50 worst films of all time list at number 37. Uh, what am I doing here? I don't know. 
on the legs of Kush. When an ancient jungle god becomes enraged that a tourist resort is being built on his sacred domain, he takes the form of a giant alligator, which later we find out is actually a crocodile, and seeks his bloody rampage of revenge on the people with state-of-the-art special effects. It's up to a photographer and the resort owner's foxy assistant to save the day. This is my most valuable assistant. Welcome. From 1979, The Great Alligator, which really should be called The Great Crocodile, but it's not. It's The Great Alligator. A nightmare of terror, a nightmare of horror. When country singers Merle Haggard, Sonny James, and Ferlin Husky encounter the villainous Lon Chaney Jr., John Carradine, and Basil Rathbone on their way to Nashville, a dubious hoedown of lame thrills and bogus chills ensues. Fear and fright. No! One of the cinema's largest mistakes hillbillies in a haunted house a jamboree of songs a galaxy of stars we're on our way to a swinging jamboree yeah. you want it black you got it black if you were pleasantly surprised by Black Belt Jones, then you'll be pleasantly repulsed by TNT Jackson. Another gem from the 1970s karate black exploitation genre, TNT Jackson stars Playboy Playmate Jeannie Bell as a karate expert searching for her brother's killer on the mean streets of Hong Kong. But her journey introduces TNT to many villains, like the dreaded knife guy from the alley, and the two men afraid of a suitcase, and finally ends with the opposing afros both the good and the bad. With the swiftness of a deadly cosmic ray, the Earth is invaded by indestructible moon monsters. Their ghastly mission, death for all humans. Robot Monster is so atrociously bad that soon after its release, the movie's director, Phil Tucker, attempted to kill himself with a gun. He missed. Mankind. Robot Monster brings you an actual preview of the devastating forces of our future. Unsuspected revelations of incredible horrors that will terrify you with their brutal reality. Released in 1953 in 3D, Robot Monster utilized not only the terror and fright instilled by bubble machines, but also the macabre realism of an alien in a gorilla costume with a diver's helmet. There is no escape from me. Very well. I will recalculate. Your death will be indescribable. Fool humans, there is no escape. Hero astronaut Stephen West returns from outer space. His body is melting at an increasing rate. To survive, he must get human cells. He is the incredible melting man. Even though future Oscar winner Rick Baker designed the special effects for the incredible melting man, this 1977 gem still makes the 50 worst list at number 32. They're running out of everything but rules. Firebird 2015. 
when having a full tank of gas makes you fair game. It's killing those on Accidents. Murders. In the not-too-distant future, the U.S. government outlaws all gas-burning vehicles, except for the gas-burning vehicles, which chase the other gas-burning vehicles in an attempt to stop them. Damn, damn, damn. Burner, that's right, I am a burner. Shot entirely in the desert, where it's free, it's Firebird 2015 AD, a 1981 film where you can actually see the shame on the faces of the actors. <laughs> Firebird, 2015 A.D. Driving force for freedom. Driving force for freedom. Firebird, ain't right out yet. We're going to fly. They'll never shoot us down. Firebird, 2015 A.D. The two most feared villains in cinema history finally meet in 1971. Dracula versus Frankenstein. <laughs> Throw in Lon Chaney Jr. in his last film appearance as an axe-wielding maniac, a Dracula with an afro, and a Frankenstein creature with a face that looks like a raw steak, and you're left with number 30 on the list of the worst films of all time. Dracula versus Frankenstein. Ed Wood is notoriously remembered as one of the worst directors in cinema history. Hello. Take the girl to my quarters. 1955's Bride of the Monster is one of the reasons why. Let me loose. Do you hear me? You will be soon as big as a giant. Or like all the others. Bela Lugosi mumbled most of his lines throughout the film. Tor Johnson bumps into almost everything on the set. And the infamous fake octopus was actually stolen from the Republic Studios backlot. But they forgot to steal the motor. So they just wiggle it around. From the festering bowels of the early 80s comes Smokey and the Bandit, Part 3. When Burt Reynolds decided not to reprise his role as the Bandit, the makers of this film originally shot it with Jackie Gleason, playing both the Sheriff and the Bandit, cleverly titling this gem, Smokey is the Bandit. As of this instant, Junior, we're in hot pursuit. <laughs> But when test audiences became confused and downright stupefied, parts of the movie were reshot with Jerry Reed playing the bandit. The release date was postponed, and the title was switched to Smokey and the Bandit, Part 3. Open your eyes and hear the magic. Imagine a stew with the ingredients of disco music, a Greek tragedy, a roller rink, Olivia Newton-John, and Gene Kelly. And the concoction you're left with is what one film critic simply declared, Xana Don't. From 1980, Xana Do. With a budget of $20 million, Xanadu grossed barely half that back in its entire theatrical run. Possibly because it played as a 99-cent double feature with the Village People's film, Can't Stop the Music. Xanadu, where time stops and the magic never ends. Xanadu, coming this summer.
the president picked him. We need you, Leonard, to save the world. When a movie is bad, it receives a Razzie Award, which is the equivalent of an Oscar for bad movies. When a movie is horribly bad, it receives two Razzie Awards. And when a movie is as terribly bad as Leonard Part 6, it gets three Razzie Awards, and its producer and star Bill Cosby goes on several talk shows at its release and denounces the film as truly dreadful, advising people not to see it. That's how bad it is. At number 26, it's Leonard Part 6. Anytime the title of a movie is hand-drawn, it's destined to be bad. Somewhere on a tropical island, two tribes exist. The Wongo tribe, who are comprised of beautiful women and ugly men, and on the other side of the island, is the Guna tribe, which is the opposite. Handsome men and ugly women. But they're men. Well, that's what we came here for, wasn't it? And when that old tricky bastard called Love gets involved, the story really takes off. Angor, you spoke the truth about these women of Wongo. This one's mine. He's cute. The incredible acting in the film, coupled with the uncanny realism of jungle life, makes The Wild Women of Wongo the 25th worst film ever made. Shut up! Okay, banga banga. Since when do you talk a native language? I just started today. Well, what did he say? What did he say? I don't even know what I said. Bella Lugosi meets a Brooklyn gorilla is a B-movie all around with a debatable all-star cast. Duke Mitchell and Sammy Petrillo turn an island paradise into the zaniest madhouse in the seven seas. That is, if you consider the Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis rip-off duo of Duke Mitchell and Sammy Petrillo stars, plus a washed-up Bella Lugosi playing none other than a mad scientist. Run for your life! Go on, get out of here, run for your life! One half of this deservedly unfamous duo of Duke and Sammy was actually sued by Jerry Lewis for copying his, well, his everything. But the lawsuit didn't prevent this flop from being filmed for just under $50,000 on a nine-day shoot. And yes, it's another film with a gorilla in it. Enjoying the last of the song. Oh, the doctor! Sit down. Boris Karloff's contract with Universal Pictures ran out in 1939. Apparently, so did his status as the master of horror, because in 1940, he made the ape with monogram pictures. She'd have been just 18 today. She was to have worn that. I couldn't save her, and I couldn't save our mother. I hadn't the weapons to fight the disease that killed them, but I have now. Karloff plays Dr. Adrian, a scientist mad with passion towards curing polio. All the while perusing the town at night in the skin of an escaped circus ape that he killed. A tricky plot, indeed. The dog. And Karloff always has his famous dying scene. There. You see? As did this film.
The science fiction craze, which swept across theater screens in the late 1970s, also brought with it many cheap B-grade duplicates in its wake. Cheap duplicates like Galaxy of Terror from 1981. It orbits a burned-out star at the edge of the galaxy. They're out there. Galaxy of Terror has all the qualities of a terrible film, including its star, Aaron Moran, who you may remember as Joni from Happy Days. What are the odds of us getting out of here? And the film even tried to titillate audiences by introducing the first worm-like alien that makes sweet, sweet love to human women. In all of its awfulness, Galaxy of Terror does have one redeeming factor to it. Its unit director was a young James Cameron who would go on to direct Terminator and Titanic many years later. But what he was most known for in this film was making maggots wiggle on a severed arm by electrocuting them. What do you do when you want to steal an Aztec treasure from a tomb haunted by a mummy? You build a robot to do it for you. We dare you to see them, but don't come alone. Ah! From 1957, the robot versus the Aztec mummy. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest one of all? There's no fairy tale quite so inspiring as Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, unless you're referring to the German-made movie, Snow White, or as they call it, Schneewittchen. And dig these crazy dwarf names. I am Whitey, and the next one is Bushy. I'm called Eddie, and I'm called Teddy, and this one is Freddy. My name is Blackie, and I am called Bim Bam. The story seems to be the same. You have the Wicked Witch and the Apple. Very well. Then I'll cut the apple in two. The red half is for you. But this Snow White is just way too bizarre not to make the 50 worst list. After the revolution in Cuba, American gangsters plot with Cuban generals an ingenious scheme to smuggle gold out of the country via a tour boat. How much Jack do you think's in that strong rock? Mm -hmm. There's plenty of Cuban sugar, though. But when a secret agent named Sparks Moran penetrates their plan... Don't worry, Mary Bell. I'll save you. ...and a horrifying sea monster stands in their path... B-grade chills and sugar-free thrills are sure to arise from Roger Corman's Creature from the Haunted Sea. It's all right. Be calm, everybody. The boat's insured. I ought to call my name on that tip, then see what he got to say. Speaking of Roger Corman, after being fired by him, director Jack Hill branched out and formed his own brand of cheap cinema. The result was the swinging cheerleaders. It's men's business, Marianne. Bullshit. A 1974 film that was difficult to label, it was the story of a female reporter who joined a college cheerleading team in order to expose its demeaning nature 
but learned a lesson in assumptions instead. It's girls like you give the boys something they think is worth fighting for. Gosh, that just makes me tingle all over when you talk like that. Ron, come on. Let's do it some more. I want to do it every way there is. This is my first time. I want it to be wonderful. Somebody one time told me that if there's absolutely no way that you can get out of taking a terrible beating, the only intelligent thing for you to do is to try to get in the first lick. In 1967, Born Losers introduced the world to a new denim-clad hero, Billy Jack. Four years later, Billy Jack, its sequel, hit the screens to an adoring fan base. Pick it up. But the third in the series, The Trial of Billy Jack, was just a bit too much for audiences in 1974. What Gene has really taught us here and in the Child Abuse Center is that everyone has inside of them a fantastic force, and it can really change people once it's unleashed. Is this what you call nonviolence? We call it by something much cornier than that. We call it love. Coming in at nearly three hours, most of which is spent communing at the hippie commune, Billy Jack returns from a stint in prison to find a new batch of villains bothering his Native American friends, not to mention stirring up trouble at the Freedom School, disrupting beautiful ballads like this one heard here. Don't turn back, Billy Jack. I am crying, are you dying just for me? You might almost prefer watching Billy Jack to the wooden acting of Peter Graves in 1954's Killers from Space. They're here, they're here, they're going to destroy us. It's all right, Dr. Martin. You're with friends. You'll be all right. They'll kill everyone. We've got to stop them! Easy, Doug. Easy. Who are you? Another from the Martian invaders, nobody believes the scientist genre. Only there are no gorilla aliens. Only Martians with big eyes. Stay where you are. And lizards made to look like giant dinosaurs. I'll kill him. And of course, Peter Graves' own brand of seventh grade acting. <laughs> Finally, sexy gals, psycho chicks and sweet jazz. A combination worth a view. Spider Baby tells the tale of the crazy inbred Mary family who all have a disease that makes them mentally regress from the age of 10. Only mentally though. Those bodies keep on growing at a regular rate. Oh yeah, and there's Lon Chaney too. But don't worry, not much. But trouble arises when feudal relatives move in and attempt to take the house. Now that's a movie. Please, try to describe it. Like nothing I've ever seen before. You're the only one who saw it and survived. For those of you who thought Joan Crawford was one of the greatest actresses in cinema, we bring you Trog from 1970, Crawford's last film.
The budget was so small for Trog that Joan Crawford had to supply her own wardrobe and use her own car as a dressing room. This kill crazy fiend from hell must be destroyed. You may want to hide. You may want to forget what you see, but you can't. You can't escape. Stay where you are, Dr. Brockton. That's an order. When the Three Stooges enter the race for space, everyone else runs for the hills. After 30 years, the Three Stooges should have just hung up their squirt tricks and curly replacements and called it quits. But they didn't. Mama Booba Taiko! Yaba Hama Mama Booba Taiko! Take the machine at once. Destroy the Earth as you leave. Destroy the Earth! They continued making movies well into the 1960s. This is a red alert! Repeat, red alert! Did you see what I just saw? And they actually believed the pie-in-the-face routine would still humor audiences. Now see you! But once they made the Three Stooges in orbit, they went too far. Obsoletism has never been so obvious. that an ad-libbed kung fu movie had to make it into the list of the 50 worst movies of all time. But I'll bet you didn't figure on a kung fu movie about an armless man and a legless man becoming kung fu masters and seeking revenge against the teacher that made them. The story of two young men who are cut off in their pride. They seek revenge, but they're handicapped by their limited knowledge of Kung Fu, never by their will. From, surprisingly, 1984, The Crippled Masters. You would think with a film called The Sorceress, there would be a sorceress, but there is none. Only horribly cheap special effects and a plot that wiggles and tries like a small dog painfully trying to pass a sharp peach seed. Mighty magical women warriors are given the power of sorcery and the fighting skills of the masters. Two warrior twins who for some reason thought they were men fight the forces of evil in a wingding of bad effects and bad acting. Evil magic and a battle to control the entire known world. Source and sorcery. Sorceress. Someone please come in. 140,000. Push the red. Fuck, oh, Steve, help me. Help me. Claude, what does it mean I'm stacked? Stacked? When the hand of a dead astronaut winds up on the beach and is found by a student, it begins not only strangling the townspeople, but also possessing the student who found it. It becomes the crawling hand! The crawling hand demands to live, commands you to see it. A disembodied hand holds the key to a killer more deadly than the supernatural. Burt Reynolds screen tested twice for the role of Paul the Teenager, but reportedly acted so terribly he wasn't asked back. Yet, Alan Hale Jr. made the cut. He's a killer. He doesn't come over here quietly and put that bottle down. I'll have to shoot him. But he's just a kid! 
you may remember that paper bag acting from Gilligan's Island, where he played the skipper. It strikes deadly. Silently, it will not relent. The crawling hand must destroy in order to exist. It will strike you deadly. The crawling hand. I am... Midgets, naked women, extreme torture, bad acting. Bloodsucking Freaks was originally banned in the United States following the protest by the Women Against Pornography movement. But the ban was lifted sometime later, and Master Sardu was free again to spew his words of lethargy. But if you are skeptical or bored, then just pretend that what you see is real. And his macabre theater of cheap effects and women who eat ears and crazy midgets were once again free to run amok in blood-sucking freaks. A law student innocently participates in a hypnotist show, which allows his soul to become possessed by the spirit of a 1940s gangster named J.D. Hence the title of the film, J.D.'s Revenge. Lately I've been getting these headaches, you know. I've never felt this lost before in my life. You beat me up. Like you were. Uh... I don't remember doing any of those things. Maybe something is happening to me. Slowly. He begins to change, adopting the style and ghetto charm of the deceased, J.D. And then comes the revenge part. Something about his sister or his chick or something. What in the world have you done to yourself? I ain't seen a get up like that in 25 years. <laughs> Yay. I'm the craziest nigga you ever can meet. <laughs> Yay. He wasn't himself. Don't nobody talk to me like that. He turned into this, into this monster, a whole other person. Scared of your dad. Well, there is something wrong with Ike. Tonight he kept saying he was this J.D. Walker. J.D. Walker's been dead for over 30 years. He's J.D. Walker. What the hell do you mean J.D. Walker is back? This boy is possessed by the spirit of J.D. Walker. So you're a jack leg preacher now, Elijah. <laughs> J.D.'s voice. Where's that good for nothing, brother, y'all? In his manner? I got stole to settle with him. You were possessed. You just killed Betty Joe! It's a duel of personalities as Ike and J.D. fight for possession of the body. J.D.'s revenge. I'll have my revenge. You want bad? You want, like, just lame, bad? Do your eyes dare witness total terror? Frankenstein meets the space monster. When the women of Mars are destroyed by an atomic bomb, it's up to the Martian princess and her henchmen to restock their planet. We have come here to this planet for one purpose only, to acquire breeding stuff to repopulate our planet. Their search takes them to many backyard parties where the evil Martians, who look like regular human astronauts, gather up the human cattle. And I bet you're asking yourself, where does Frankenstein fall into all of this? Well, not only is Frankenstein Earth's only hope for survival because missiles always miss the Martian headquarters, but Frankenstein is really just a robot astronaut named Frank that got his circuitry screwed up by the Martian attacks, and only he can fight the Martian monster and end their hostile takeover. Frankenstein meets the space monster in What is that? It's a Sorex sericidae. Looks like a small rat. Shrews as small as rats. 
perfect for scientific experiments until they began to grow and grow into things. A bumbling scientist creates a strain of shrews that not only are the size of dogs, but really are just dogs with fake hair and fangs glued on them. They must eat three times their own weight in food every 24 hours or starve. And a hero that in two decades would be forever immortalized as Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane in The Dukes of Hazard. And a film that was actually made to be a B-grade double feature, The Killer Shrews. If all of this looks fairly familiar to you, don't be alarmed. Jaws did not make the list, but its Italian-made copy did. The similarities were uncanny. A sleepy little town, much like Amity. A scene like when Roy Scheider yells from a megaphone to get people out of the water. A Robert Shaw sea captain character, but played laughably in this one by Vic Morrow. A sunken boat with part of a body inside. A scene where the great white shark tears off the end of a pier with two fishermen on it. And yes, the movie rips off Jaws Part 2 as well, when the shark attacks a helicopter and pulls it underwater. The similarities were so noticeable that Universal Pictures sued the producers of this film and it was pulled from American theaters shortly after it was released. From 1980, Great White. Turn off your electro gun! No! No! Stop him, Dennis! I can't get it, it's a jam! Grab him, you fool! Drop the gun to the floor, Tanner. The metal will break contact. Ed Wood returns to the list with his worst film ever, Plan 9 from Outer Space. And remember, my friend, future events such as these will affect you in the future. Wood and the cast of Plan 9 were all baptized before filming began because the only backer that would fund the movie was a Baptist church. Ed Wood almost always use the first take, as you can see by the microphone shadow seen here. And check out the cardboard cutout steering wheels. Burbank Tower to American Flight 812, over. Holy mackerel. One of the legends behind Plan 9 is that Wood used everything from hubcaps, pizza pans, pie tins, and even paper plates as the UFOs. The truth is, the UFOs are actually children's plastic model kits hung from fishing line. And now take note of the continuity here, or the lack thereof. Daytime. Nighttime. Daytime. Nighttime. Daytime. Nighttime. And although Plan 9's star, Bella Lugosi, died four days after shooting began, it didn't stop Wood. For the remainder of the film in Bella's place was Wood's wife's chiropractor, who played Bella's part with the cape covering his face the whole time. Oh yes, Plan 9 from Outer Space is bad. But it's not the worst. I want to transplant my head on a healthy body. I think I'd like to donate my body to science after all. Nearly 30 years after Ray Milan won an Oscar for his portrayal of an alcoholic in The Lost Weekend, he starred in The Thing with Two Heads as a rich bigot whose only chance for survival is to transplant his head onto Rosie Greer's body. We are joined together temporarily. 
Williams, stop this car immediately. Why don't you shut up? Hey, that's Delna, man. I should have known your kind stick together. Will you please stop this infernal machine? Oh, just shut up. Help! Shut up. You a doctor? So far, so good. Then how about you taking old happy face off of here? Are you shooting at it? Man, this car's a real dust. Could I have a cigarette? Oh, sure. Hey, man, we spoken while I'm eating. Rightfully positioned at number three is The Thing with Two Heads from 1972. You get some sleep, baby. Why don't you stay here for a little while? No use, honey. Maybe when I get used to it. Now you know you got to go. There's bad, and there's real bad. And then, there's Ega. Ega! Ega! Ega is the tale of a misunderstood prehistoric caveman, played by the future James Bond villain Richard Keel, who emerges from the ravaging deserts of Palm Springs in 1962 with a case of untamed lust for a teenage chick. There he is! Ho! Ho to a fire! Don't shoot! He's just in the tent! Oh! Oh, no. oh. <laughs> the second worst movie of all time, Ega. Finally, the worst movie ever made. The first and last monster musical. It's the incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies. From the innocence of music and laughter comes the twilight of terror. Along the midway, scantily clad dancers luring the young lovers into the sideshows. See the dancing girls of the carnival murdered by the incredible night creatures of the midway. I only know that something evil lies ahead for me. An unspeakable pit of dismal subhuman monsters who drool and gibber, moaning for the thrill of revenge. Incredible are the songs, the gaiety, the zombie stomp of those who will stop living. And then the mix-up, trickery, and the device to ruin. See the hunchback of the midway fight a duel of death with the mixed-up zombies. Turning men into monsters, twisted, tormented human vultures. Yearning to kill. Incredible creatures clutching at the thin thread of their miserable lives. Human vultures, only the weird zombies remain. Okay. On a budget of $38,000, Ray Dennis Steckler not only directed, but starred in this gem. But he used his much cooler stage name, Cash Flag. Yes, the incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies wins the title as the worst movie ever made. You've seen the bad, the terrible, and the worst movies of all time, all 50 of them. From gorilla costumes, to crawling hands, to rubber monsters, and midgets playing trolls. These movies truly are the bottom of the barrel. Bullshit. And they have rightfully earned their status as the 50 worst films of all time. Thank you.